So who is Master Shen Yan? Uh, he's, uh, he's a monk uh, who was born in China in 1930. And he became a monk uh, at the age of 13 at that time, uh, largely because his family was very poor. And so a monastery was going around uh, looking for uh, young, young people who would like to be a novice monk. And um, he thought, oh, I'll go, I'll go be a monk. And so he, uh, he, he, he did that. And um, so, and he told of the story of him being very slow and just couldn't like learn and memorize anything. And his master told him to do a lot of prostrations to um, Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara for help, and he did, he did exactly that. Lots, hundreds and hundreds and thousands of them. And one day he was able to memorize the chants and the liturgy. So um, Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, is, uh, he, he considered that as his very, uh, very important Bodhisattva for him. And, um, when he, in his, uh, the monastery at which he ordained had a uh, branch monastery in Shanghai. And so later on in his teen years, he was sent to that branch monastery. And at that time in China, monks were, uh, uh, at least in this monastery in Shanghai, they were largely um, going around doing um, rituals for the deceased. Uh, that's how they earn income for the monastery to sustain um, the, the monastic's li livelihood. And it was also a time of uh, decline in, monast uh, in Buddhism in, in China. And he felt very sad about it because um, he thought, as from his study, that um, the Buddha Dhamma is so wonderful. That's one thing he, he often would mention in his writing. The Buddha Dhamma is so wonderful, but so few people know of it. And um, and more, uh, and a lot of people who know of it misunderstood it. So he gave rise to this vow to really uh, explain and uh, teach the Dhamma so that more people will have a correct understanding of the Dhamma so that they could truly benefit from the precious uh, three jewels. And because of this vow, uh, he had very little education because his family was very poor. And um, the, in Shanghai, he uh, found an opportunity that the, it was a time when there began to be Buddhist institutes to train monastics in formal Buddhist uh, study. And uh, it was not easy to get admitted, and he had very little formal education, but his great vow drove him to try to gain admission, and he was admitted and um, actually did very well in the study. And then he encountered the communist revolution in China in 1949. And they uh, understood that when the communists took over, many monastics would be forced to return to lay life. And he was worried about their prospects. So he followed the nationalist army to go to Taiwan. And the only way to do that was to join the military. So uh, this is a good example. Was that he wanted to be able to stay on the path. If it involves taking a detour in the military and endure all that hardship, that's what he would do while he was in the military. Um, he maintained his vegetarian diet, which meant basically a few pieces of vegetable around other, other stuff that he ate. He was uh, able to be flexible with how he could practice in that situation and use all his off time to practice and visit, uh, practice with and visit the Buddhist masters, many of whom went to Taiwan from China for the same reason. And during the time he was in the military, he worked very hard. He worked in the communications department, meaning he wasn't in combat. And he also tried very hard to uh, actually uh, gain advancement in the ranks. Why? Not because of his personal ambition, but to show people that he was someone who is willing to, uh, to work hard. 
um, that he is intelligent because what he was trying to do was to find the right people to help him get out of the military so that he could become a monk again. And at that time, it was impossible to leave the military in that very oppressive regime. And, but miracle happened. Someone helped him leave the military, which allowed him to return to monastic life after 10 years being in the military. So I want to draw your attention to how important vow power is to allow him to go through that whole process. And when he returned to monastic life, he was ordained by his master, Master Dong Chu, who, um, who uh, had a very uh, special way of treating, training his students, largely by uh, putting him through a lot of impossible errands, made him mad, humiliate him, and try to help him dissolve his self-centered attachments. And Master Shen Yan, uh, at that time, sometimes he said he could, he felt frustrated, but he also saw how compassionate his master was being in putting him through that training. After uh, some time with this master, he did, uh, he asked his master for the opportunity to go and enter a six-year solitary retreat. Again, it was not easy to find someone who was willing to support you in a six-year solitary retreat, meaning someone being willing to support you. And so he worked on the causes and conditions and to um, put together someone who would support him. And he took his leave. That's during that time he wrote his first books on, uh, on the heart of Buddhist teaching that made it accessible to many people who couldn't understand what the Buddha Dhamma really was about. And that was one of the first books I read uh, from Master Shen Yan when I encountered his teaching. After he returned from, he came out from the mon uh, solitary retreat, he realized what's really needed for Buddhism to be, to be accepted and respected by Chinese people at that time, who largely thought Buddhism was just some superstitious religion for uneducated people. He realized what he needed is for monastic to become more educated for Chinese, uh, for them to be respected in Chinese society. So he took it upon himself to travel to Japan to, to study for a doctorate degree in Buddhist literature. So he had, again, remember he had very little formal education. He didn't know any Japanese. He went to get a doctorate degree in Japanese. So he wrote his dissertation in four years record speed in Japanese, and it's all driven by his vow to bring the Dharma to everyone by doing, by doing what he needs to do. And after he finished his doctor degree, he was a bit ahead of everyone. And uh, folks in Taiwan didn't know what to do with someone that, with a doctor degree. So he was, uh, he accepted an, an inv invitation to be a professor in, I think first in Canada. And he realized after a while that it really couldn't work because he didn't, he didn't speak any English. And so uh, that didn't work out. And, uh, but he, uh, he got another invitation to go to New York to, to teach as a Buddhist teacher. And that start began his journey of teaching the Dharma in the West. And uh, many things happened over the years. One of the things that he did was to give Dharma transmission, full Dharma transmissions to some lay teachers in the West, one of whom my current teacher, actually um, his first lay Dharma heirs was also my teacher. And uh, his second lay Dharma heirs is my current teacher uh, from whom I received my transmission. 
and because of his work, he um, he left a very important legacy. And so Master Shen Yan, for uh, many people, he's known as someone uh, who an important figure in Chan Buddhism in the in in the United States, or oftentimes. Um, Chan was like, oh, Chan, Chan's Master Shen Yan. So for, for people who are, who are familiar with Chan are likely to have heard of Master Shen Yan and may be familiar with, with his work. So a little bit of uh, introduction about who Ch um, Chan Master Shen Yan is. And besides, uh, besides Chan, he uh, teaching in the, in the US, uh, he has also establish a very large network of Buddhist centers in Asia uh, uh, with the headquarter in Taiwan called Dhammadram Mountain. Dhammadram Mountain has a large Chan Hall, Chan practice program, which is a part of that huge campus. It has university, a Buddhist university, which is a liberal art university, Sangha University, and also publishing house as well as a um, large congregation of uh, volunteers and followers in Taiwan and all over the world. And he has published over 100 books. He was also an important Buddhist studies scholar. His scholarly work still got cited often when people want to uh, study development of Chinese Buddhism, in, especially in Ming Dynasty. That's just some of the few things he did. So he was not only a Chan master. So you can tell that this is someone who works very hard. Um, most, not because he's a workaholic. Most largely it's because he knows he has to use every moment of this precious human life of his to fulfill the great vow he has made. And he has, uh, when he gave transmission to my two teachers, John Crook and Simon Child, I also learned from their example that they uh, took their, their transmission very seriously. Master Xun Yan talk about Dharma transmission. Um, oftentimes this is being uh, misunderstood by people that um, like Dharma transmission as if it's some kind of achievement. Uh, it is not a status, it's not an achievement per se. Uh, Master Yin often said it is really a master giving responsibility for, to you, uh, very heavy responsibility to pass on the Dharma. And uh, John Crook and Simon Chow, I watched them taking this responsibility very seriously. They devoted their whole life to trying to find ways to make Chan practice accessible to the Western educated mind. It's a lot of the teaching passing down the generation um, were designed for, for those who were educated in the, in the Chinese or Asian way. And there are, there are things that really need to be adapted uh, for our not, not, not just culturally, but also for our, really for people living in modernity. We just think differently. And so, um, and I also learned from their example in how seriously they take their responsibility. Even though Master Shen Yan didn't really give them a choice. Uh, the story was that John Crook turned up in the retreat and at the end of the retreat, it's like, here, I'm going to give you a transmission. And he went home and wrote in, some, in their magazine and told, told uh, folks in his sangha, it's like, like, yeah, every time I go see Master Shen Yan, you know, something happened. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't expect that at all, but he took it on uh, and took it very seriously. And similar thing happened to Simon Child. And, um, he reminds me of what happened. Uh, I think John Crook did the same thing to me when one time I turned up at his retreat uh, as a participant. It might be the second time I attended this retreat or the third time at most. 
He said, here, Rebecca, you're going to be in charge of the retreat of the, of the Chan Hall. <laughs> I said, OK, <laughs> I do my best. <laughs> so um, this is part of the training that he, they learned from Master Shenin as well. So uh, I hope I did an OK job in giving you a sense of who Master Shenin was. Okay, like okay, I need to. Okay, so thank thank you for nothing. <laughs> thank you. Um, and some of you mentioned you would like to know about my practice. I in the, I share a little bit with uh, with some with you earlier this week. Since there are folks joining from uh, online, I'd like to um, some of that maybe uh, maybe repeated. So. Um, I told a story that I didn't grow up Buddhist, uh, how people assume that uh, because I, I look Chinese, my, I, I'm the one who made my white Kansas-born husband Buddhist, um, so, which is the other way around. And I, I met him, I met my husband. Uh, at that time, we were not married yet, uh, when I was in graduate school in Southern California. And at that time, it may be a little difficult for some of you to understand that was before Google. <laughs> try, try to understand before the internet, um, before Amazon. So the only way to get Dharma books was to go to a library, a good library. <laughs> those, remember those, a library with actual books in them. Um, so I would, um, I would travel with him to drive an hour out in towards L in the LA area to go to a Chinese monastery that has a good library and they let you check out books. So we check them out and bring them back to, to our home, read it so that we can bring it back the following week. That's our weekly routine. And um, one of the early books that I read was this the two, uh, the two books that Master Shen Yan wrote during his six-year solitary retreat, one was his autobiography, telling his, his story, uh, some of which I'll share with you. The other was his uh, explanation of what all kinds of different like misunderstanding, misconception about Buddhism, which was very common among Chinese people. What's karma, what's rebirth, all kinds of things. And I remember distinctly feeling that this all makes so much sense, the way he explained it. And I felt a really close affinity with his teaching. And at that time, one of his, uh, one of his disciples who had, then, uh, who had attended some retreats with him started a meditation group in the area where I was going to graduate school. My, um, my, my husband at that time was already attending that group. So he brought me to, he, he brought me to that group after, after sensing that I might be interested. So he didn't drag me there. Uh, so I remember the first time I attended the, the group, someone just returned to, from, from an intensive retreat with Master Shen Yin in New York and share his experience attending the retreat. And I remember, remember thinking that I want to go to that retreat and set my mind to attending. It was very difficult to uh, get to get into one of Master Shen Yin's retreat at that time because they were always full with his regular participants because they had a relatively small space accommodating only 30 people at that time. And so I applied again after I got rejected. And I got rejected the second time and I applied again. When I applied the third time, I called them and they finally accepted me. I perseverance, if there's something you want to do, persevere, don't give up easily. And I finally got accepted in 96 May. I still remember my first retreat. And uh, it was difficult, that retreat, because they get up at 4 a.m., which is 1 a.m. in California. 
which is usually when I went to bed. So a lot of drowsiness. I practiced with a lot of drowsiness. Uh, and I couldn't really remember much about the meditation itself, except that I didn't give up. I just practiced with drowsiness and follow some of the instruction given by Master Xing on how to deal with drowsiness. And uh, I remember feeling when I went to interview with him the very first time that um, I finally find you. I, don't, I wasn't looking for anyone, but I just felt that very strong sense that I finally found the teacher, the man, my master. And I couldn't stop crying. And he's like, why are you crying? He asked me. And so uh, I remember that distinctly. And at the end of the retreat, he asked everyone to share the retreat experience. Um, by the way, I couldn't really understand Mandarin. He was speaking in Mandarin. So I was relying on his, trans on his translator. And so most people, share, the Chinese people spoke, share in Chinese and I share in English because my Mandarin was not good enough to speak in Mandarin. And I've, I couldn't remember what I said, but I, after I, I said what I said, he looked me in my eyes and said, you're gonna help a lot of people. Yeah. And I, I don't know what I was gonna do to help people because I couldn't understand even his Chinese, but that's what I, the moments I remember from that, from that retreat, I felt a very strong connection with him. And early on, when I was going to that library to borrow those books, um, some of them were Chinese books, and there was one set of verses, verses that I that really um, touched and stood out for me. And some of you may have encountered that set of verses. Oftentimes, they show up in the beginning of a book or a sutra. It's um, it, it goes like this. This is my translation. Um, the Buddha Dhamma is difficult to encounter. Now I have encountered. Human birth is difficult to acquire. Now I have acquired. If I do not make use of this human birth to deliver myself, when will this body be delivered? Meaning liberated from samsara. And every time I encountered this set of verses, I was on the verge of tears. I felt uh, deeply touched by it. I felt the urgency of having, having and making the vow to make Dhamma practice a top priority in my life. That was before I met Master Shen Yan. And so that first summer that I uh, started reading his book, I, I heard that he was going to, um, he was going to come to Los Angeles, well, which he rarely did. And uh, I was planning to go uh, to listen to his talk. And also he was, I was told he was going to do the three refuges ceremony and I would be able to take the three refuges with him. And I already planned to go take the three refuges with him, even though I have not met him before. I felt like I, I'm ready. And so the few days before that talk, I got very sick and I was laying there feeling that I, I'm feeling so sick, so weak. And the thought came through my mind that I may not be able to go because I'm so sick. And then I still remember this very strong response to that thought was that even if I have to crawl to Los Angeles, I will go. And I still remember the feeling of that sense of determination. Um, and that's what I meant by somehow the vow power propel me in those moments. And that was very important. I did go. It, meeting him, taking a refuge at that time, shaped the trajectory of, of my life. Um, because uh, during, during that was around the, the time towards the end of my graduate school years, and I needed to start thinking about the next phase of my, of my life. And 
I was finishing graduate school, thinking about going on a job market. Uh, I don't know about you, if you when you started thinking about the going to job market, jobs, um, confusing time. Uh, what's what kind of job should you get? And in academia, where I was, uh, would it be going for the highest status job that I can get? Because that would mean success. That would mean uh, I've proven myself to be worthy of my professor. And of course, my professor would want me to uh, to be, to be like them, uh, but how about what it is that is important for me? And also, um, the kind of craving for approval, craving for recognition can get one to go for a job that may not be a good fit for the life we would want to live. And I was very lucky that at the time I've already encountered a practice and the vow to make Dharma practice and Dharma work my top priority in my life. So it was very important for me that I would find a job where the, uh, it's a place that will allow and encourage me to have balance in my life. That I have to work hard, but also there will be space for my, my home life and also my Dharma practice and my Dharma work. That means it's not going to be a place that expect me to spend all my time working. And that may not be the kind of position expected of me by my professors or other people who, think, who have their expectation of me. And so it was important for me to have that clarity and also the priority of being able to practice with Master Xun Yan. So how I, that's how I ended up in New Jersey, so that I could be close to, um, to Master Xun Yan Center. And I remember I was also uh, making an honest assessment of my ability, my strengths and weaknesses, uh, so that I could find the kind of position where that is, that's a good fit for, for my ability. And um, and I remember when I started my academic career as an assistant professor, I touched on that a couple of days ago when I shared this a little bit, um, a couple of things became very clear to me at that time uh, with my practice. I, was, I started practicing and training with Master Xin Yan more regularly at that time. What I was able to see was that the, the position that I, I got was a fairly good fit for me. And so I saw it as a real blessing to be able to have that job. I don't know about you, have you had jobs that like you like at first and then you start to dislike it because <laughs> because you get stressed out or you have to work so hard or you have to do things that you don't like to do, uh, which all, we all encounter. And remembering that it's a blessing to have this position that accommodates my, the, the, the kind of life that I would like to live, allow me to, to remember to um, not let the difficulty and unpleasant experiences in the process of getting through tenure bother me too much. So um, I, there were some uh, colleagues who were not super friendly uh, in academia. There are a lot of egos. They say things to bolster their egos, not necessarily because they're bad people. And uh, my my making, making, remembering, remembering that it's a blessing that allow me to pursue my dharma practice and dharma work, uh, allow me to, to, to be able to overcome some of those difficult moments and also to draw on the support offered by me. So not to think that everyone's bad, everyone's mean. Uh, I've seen colleagues who fell into that, that everyone's against me and they become very defensive and um, they're not responding in helpful ways. 
and kind of went down in some downward spiral. Uh, some, some of them did not, did not finish the process, couldn't, couldn't make it through. And, um, and I think what happened is that I uh, saw that there is a greater purpose in it. It's not just about getting tenure at the end. Instead of thinking that if I don't get tenure, I fail. This is um, doing, doing this to, my, to the best of my ability uh, is part of my path to help me live a life uh, in the Dharma because I'm a lay person. Uh, I need to be able to support myself. I, do, I need to support more than myself. I have parents that I also need to support. I need to uh, do, do my part to find my way in, in the world, to uh, have a sustainable way to, to live. And it was a blessing that I had that good opportunity. And so it was, um, it was also uh, fortunate for me to have people like John Crook and Simon Child, my two teachers. Like John Crook was a professor and Simon Child was a physician in, in the UK and they, they provide this, uh, this, this example for me to be able to juggle both their professional life and their Dharma life. And the second thing that was very clear to me during those few years was that um, I could only do my best whether I would succeed or not. And I, I, have, I can only do my best and with integrity, meaning trying to go through all the hoops while getting tenure. And at the same time, I just started my training, the teacher training with Master Shen Yan. So Master Shen Yan was very demanding his, in his training. He required us to, uh, to do research, the thorough research of a topic. So like go we'll research karma and then create, make a presentation and we have to do it every week. And that was when I had to do class prep to write my research paper, to be on committees. Um, I was one of the only two people who actually do all the service in the department and all the other things that we do. So, um, very busy at work and also very demanding at the um, Dhamma teacher, uh, teacher training program. And um, what, I, what I meant by doing my best with integrity was that um, I can't pretend to be a greater researcher or scholar than I really was. So I do my best. I cannot pretend I'm someone I'm not. Because if I pretend that I'm a greater scholar than I was, uh, my department may make the wrong decision in giving me tenure. It would, it would not be good for them. And so um, it was important for me to keep that in mind. And what that means is that my performance at work before tenure needs to reflect what I will be able to sustain throughout my career and post tenure, the, which, will, which I knew would involve spending, uh, spending substantial amount of time on my Dharma practice and training. So I told myself that if my best effort could not earn me tenure, then that means that it was not the right place for me. And maybe it wasn't the right career for me. And, um, and that means that causes and conditions were such that I, I would have to do some other thing with, with my life. And the reason why I'm, I'm sharing this is that um, looking back, it, it, it doesn't mean that I was like, super heroic or something. It's like, it, why, was I, what, why was it possible for me to think that? Because the other day someone was like, how, how do we do that? And uh, I think it has something to do with the, the, the vow power that, and the, this mindset cultivated through my training with Master Shen Yan. Um, that's from his example, it's always this, it's doing, doing my best 
and not get attached to the outcome. And remembering that everything we do is to cultivate the Bodhisattva path. So I may have set out to live a life of being a professor and, and teach and, 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 and train in the Dharma, but if it doesn't work out, I will still be trained in Dharma, but maybe not as a professor. It's okay, but I put out my best effort. And um, hope, fortunately, apparently, my best effort was adequate, so I was able to, uh, to, to, pursue, to pursue my, my life in, in that way. And my, my training with Master Shenyan, my training with Master Shenyan, uh, some of you have asked me, so like, do you do a lot of retreats with him? Uh, I, I, I do. I do attend retreat with him regularly. And also because I became his translator, I attend more retreat because I, uh, a lot of time he needed me to be there in the retreat. And also Dhamma classes. And those were very important formative years because in his Dhamma classes, he emphasized the uh, importance of cultivating right view. He always said that without right view, enlightenment is not possible. Enlightenment is not about certain meditative experience. It, is, it has to be supported by right view. And so the Dharma teaching was always about cu establishing, cultivating right view. And um, so besides intensive retreats and Dharma classes, learning about right view, uh, also the teacher training, uh, learning about the appropriate attitude in a mindset in sharing, sharing the Dharma, pointing out that teaching Dharma is a form of practice. So when, when one is sharing the Dharma, either by holding space or giving a talk, it is a form of practice, just practicing in different way. And so uh, as I mentioned, I, uh, I serve as, I began to be trained by, uh, to become Master Shenyan's translator when I started out as an assistant professor. And you might remember me mentioning not, my not understanding Mandarin uh, I had one one credit course in college uh, of Mandarin, so, and I couldn't really understand Master Shunyan's accent. So um, when I train as his the translator, I have to really strengthen my Mandarin, um, try to understand his accent. Also, I need to learn uh, very quickly all the Dharma terms in Chinese and in English. So I was looking at those um, appendixes of all kinds of books all the time, staring at them and listening to his Dhamma talks and the translator. And, and so um, some people will ask how I did it. I, I, I don't know. I think, again, it's another example of um, what is possible when we are propelled by our vow. Uh, I did not plan to become his translator. I was asked to get into the training, and I was largely the only one left. Everyone thought they, they didn't want to do it, and so I, I had to keep doing it. And um, largely because Master Shenyan really had a mission to bring Chan to the West. He wanted wanted people here to be able to share the benefits of Chan practice. But he felt that he needed, he needed uh, someone who can, who can translate it into English. So I said, I guess oh, I'll do my best. I, my Mandarin is not very good, I'll do my best. And um, so uh, that's what I did. And um, it offered me the opportunity to practice in that way in intensive retreats. Um, because I realized, oh, I have to translate for Master Shenyan, then I had better be able to remember what he say. I uh, had better be able to pay attention fully to what he's saying when he was giving talks. 
And that means I better really uh, practice when I was in sitting meditation so that my, mind, my mind's not scattered. And so some people thought that being translator was a distraction for me. In fact, I actually allow me to be more motivated to practice diligently. I definitely cannot goof off. And uh, in fact, that was a, that helped me truly understand how the Bodhisattva path works. So sometimes people understand the Bodhisattva path as just, just work for other people, for the benefit of others. Actually, it's really about making the vow to bring benefits to everyone. And when we work in that way, the first person who benefit is ourselves. Because in the case of me being a translator, I hear all of Master Shen Yan's teaching and I retain a lot of them because it has to go through my mind before coming out in the English. So I don't know if other people benefit, but I benefit from Master Shen Yan's teaching first. And it has been my, my experience consistently over and over and over again. This is how the Bodhisattva way works. It is um, a way to where like, we, it's not about um, benefiting others at the expense of ourselves. It's like we, we are one of the sentient beings that, 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 that we are bringing benefit to. In fact, we're the first one who benefits by doing, by doing that. And I remember that Master Shen Yan, when I was his uh, interpreter, he, he had a couple interpreters before me. And then he told me, he's like, you know, um, what I want you to do is to not be my interpreter. So he didn't, he didn't want me to say, Master Shen Yan said this, like in the third person. He said, I want you to channel me. And then, like, it's like I, when I say, I'm mean, like, I'm, I'm him, you know, just saying in English. I said, okay. Um, <laughs> I try. <laughs> and um, so basically, he was giving me an assignment to be fully present and fully, completely connected with him when he was talking, so that, so that what he said just just come through me, just come out of my way. And then so basically uh, asking me to train to be kind of an empty vessel to, for, 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 his, for his teaching to uh, pass through me. And um, in a way, I find that very easy because I just need to remember everything he said and just say it exactly the way he said it. I didn't need to edit it. I didn't need, did not need to uh, insert myself to determine what is important, what to emphasize, picking and choosing, just say everything he says in the way he had organized and structured it. And I realized that it was a practice of letting go my self-centered attachment, my idea of what's important, what is worth emphasizing. No need for that. Just say what the master said. And he, of course, also trained me to pay close attention to what he said. And more importantly, truly take them to heart. It's not just something that, um, that the master was saying to entertain us. It was said to help us practice. And we have to make use of that in our practice. So um, that's what I have benefited a great deal in being his translator. And besides translating for his retreat, I travel with him as his translator in international religious leaders meetings. And so he allowed me to spend some time observing him up close on how to he handled various situations, and I draw on that when I encounter a situation, I will pull up. That's how a similar situation Master Xin Yan handled, handled this. 
So I would say if um, I handle any situation well, it's to his credit, it was not me. And um, when uh, in 2004, when I was uh, department chair, I was drafted to be department chair as soon as I got tenure. Uh, if you have known those people who are department chair, usually they receive condolences. Um, it's not a promotion. Um, so at the same uh, at that time, Master Shen Yan, uh, it was during an intensive retreat. I thought I was there to be in a retreat and be the translator. Uh, I believe it was the first day of the retreat. He asked me, I need you to come to a meeting. And uh, basically, he wanted me to help him form the board for the retreat, to run the retreat center for him. And so I spent most of the retreat in meetings. And at the end of the retreat, I was the board member on the ret uh, for the retreat center. And basically, he needed help and, uh, and asked me to set up the board, hired, trained, evaluate staff, set up all the system, administration, everything. And, and uh, also help, uh, over the years, help orient and support monastic Zen from Taiwan to, to help to, to run and operate the center. And so during that process, early process, I got to work with Master Shen Yan in, in that capacity as well. So I uh, learned some other things uh, working, working with him in that way. I, I share this because I want to highlight that the training is not just about meditation in the meditation hall. He trained most of, most of his students by giving them a lot of responsibilities. And it is through working with our habits, vexations, in going, working with other people, overcoming obstacles in, the, in various situations that we engage in uh, training in Chan practice. And that's also how we learn whether we are integrating right view fully in our lived experience. And another thing I did was over 10 years, I worked on his autobiography, Footprint in the Snow, some of you might have read it. And I spent a lot of time interviewing him, which allowed me to get to know him, know his life lived as a human being. Um, he was an extraordinary one. And what I, what I saw is that we can all learn from example of someone like him, uh, of making great vows and, and, and spending his life to fulfill his vow to the best of his ability. He doesn't say, I was like, I fail. Oh, it's just like, just, just, just do it. And then some of them, some of the things set out as experiment, it didn't work out. Like when he tried to be a professor without speaking English, oh, I guess that didn't work so well. Doesn't matter. It's like, don't dwell on it, do something else. And keep learning new things uh, to the best of his ability. And also not about, oh, I need to do it all by myself. He did everything possible to include and invite as many people as possible, uh, making use of their different ability, different uh, availability to, to, uh, to work with him, to fulfill, to fulfill his great vow. And in the process, making his and many people's life a very meaningful one. And that's another, another thing I learned from him. So um, I don't know if you'd be interested in a couple of stories. Uh, I mentioned that uh, something that stood out for from uh, from him for for me from uh, from Master Shen Yan's experience was his training with Master. Dong Chu, his, his teacher, when he became monastic again after being in the military. And um, 
I always uh, remember he was telling this story about Master Dong Chu told him to, um, here, this is t this tile. Go, go, I, ne I need you to find another tile that looks exactly like this one. So, and he had to go and take a bus, look, go around, but Master Dong Chu didn't give him any money to take a bus. So he had to beg people <laughs> to pay for his bus fare. And he went around and a lot of places, there's no place with the tile that looked like that. And he was so frustrated, he felt like he failed, he went back and then Master said, just laugh at him, it's like, of course there's no such tile, you know, you, there's no way for you to find the exact same tile. And <laughs> <laughs> basically sending him on this impossible mission. <laughs> and uh, and I was like, <laughs> like, of course you're not gonna get that tile. <laughs> and um, so, Imagine how it would make you feel. And uh, he, was, he, was, he got mad, he was like very frustrated. And then a similar example was he, you know, he, would, be, he, he would be writing essays and Master Dong Chu would say, what do you do writing? Like go, go, like, like I said, well, I'm, I'm supposed to write an essay to, to spread the Dhamma. Like, no, 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 go, go recite a sutra. So he said, go recite a sutra. And then he recited a sutra, recited a sutra. Said, what are you doing? I was like, you told me to recite sutra. Like, no, not reciting sutra. And he told him go do other things. So whatever he would tell him to do things, whatever he, he actually do it, and then he got criticized for doing it. How would you like that? And so um, there were many different uh, examples of this in his training with Master Dong Chu. And you might think, man, this master is very cruel. And uh, Master Xun Yan saw that as great compassion. Great compassion. How many of us can do that and not get so mad at our master and leave? Or maybe write on the internet <laughs> to <laughs> complain <laughs> about, about this teacher. <laughs> Um, and I, that, that stood out, that always stood out for me. And um, so one time when I was traveling with him to the United Nations, uh, when he was giving a talk, there was a session that um, he, he was going to be on a panel and someone, some, like someone volunteered uh, a Harvard professor was a volunteer who was also on the panel volunteered to, to be his translator in that in that panel, and so we need to get a chair for that for that uh, for that in, uh, translator, and the panel uh, panels uh, moderator went and moved the chair, and Master Shen Yan scolded me. He's like, "What is wrong with you? You should go get the chair," and I was a little bit surprised. I didn't know I was supposed to get the chair. I was like, oh yeah, of course I should go get the chair. And afterwards, I was so happy that he found me worthwhile for scolding. I saw him scold a lot of his monastic students and I felt, I thought maybe he thought a lay person would not be worthy of his scolding. And um, I, I, remember, I, took, I took that as as a sense that I was worth his time to, to teach me that way. And uh, that was this other time he, uh, I was his translator and he told a story about uh, him traveling to a conference and his translator was with him and everyone knew that was me. And then he was saying how, oh yeah, you know, and, and I was telling, I was trying to tell Rebecca, you know, like, her, she, her mouth really began to stink and she really needs to drink more water. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and so I just translated the whole thing to everyone <laughs> and uh, talking about me. And, uh, and, and this reminded me of how um, his master liked to humiliate him and uh, he likes to occasionally humiliate his students in front of everybody. And, um, I was like, thank you 
for, <laughs> for, teaching, for teaching me to let go of self-attachment. Actually, his, chi Chinese, his Chinese translator from Taiwan came up to me. He's like, oh, it's like if he did it to me, I'd be so mad. And I was like, he was not talking about me anyway. He made that up, actually. But like, uh, so it was not a true story. But uh, so it, it was a really fun, fun time. So uh, I told this story because I, I, want, I want us to to learn to be able to appreciate the importance of seeing the value in our teachers' willing, willingness to give us harsh criticism as great compassion. I often tell my students if I'm making you feel comfortable all the time. I'm clearly not doing my job. <laughs> if I can push a button occasionally, maybe I'm doing something. But we hate to have our button pushed. We hate to be asked to let go of our dearest belief, views, hate to be challenged, hate to be told that we already know everything, we d that we don't already know everything, or what we thought we know is actually not so. In the outside world, no one would tell us that we were wrong. Yeah, you're right. And then allow us to keep moving down the wrong path. It's only when we encounter someone with great compassion, would they be willing to point it out for us? We need to remember to have the wisdom to recognize that as such. And that's one of the many valuable lessons I learned from Master Sheng Yan's practice and his life. And another thing I learned from him, I want to point out, um, I've men mentioned that already, is his great vow. Because of his great vow, he's willing to take on uh, the heaviest of responsibilities. In his, in his autobiography, he talked about how he was having his sangha in the, in the US. He thought he was, okay, I came to do this. I was doing good, you know? And he was doing this thing that he, he thought he wanted to do. <coughs> And then his master uh, passed away in Taiwan and basically put the, entire, the center and all the stuff on him. You here, you, you need to take this over. He didn't plan to do that. That was not his preference. He did it anyway. So he started splitting his time between Taiwan and New York. Just need to fly back and forth, work harder, find a way to make that work to fulfill his responsibility. And as I mentioned, his disciple, John Crook and Simon Child, largely did the same thing. They turned up for a retreat. Here, you carry the lineage onward. And they took it on and uh, devoted their life to do that propelled by the great vow. And so, and that's something we all can cultivate. Starting, starting from small things, taking on a little bit more responsibility in supporting our Sangha, pushing ourselves into unfamiliar territory. And that's actually what, Master, what I learned from Master Shenyan as well. He was always uh, seeking uh, willing to seize opportunity to learn new things. For example, when he was invited to this uh, religious leaders meeting in the United Nations, he went and never did things like that. He went and tried to learn, you know, what happened. 
and I think the other day I shared a story of he turned up in one time and so after seeing that everybody hugs, he's like, okay, maybe I, I'll do that. I, I will try, I will learn to hug people when, when, uh, when, when I see these other religious leaders in this meeting to, to make connection with them, to learn how, um, how things work in these conferences because not, not to be the popular one, because these are all skillful means to find a way to connect with others, to make positive affinity with others, so that he could share the benefits of the Dharma with everyone he encountered, because he know these people in turn will be able to influence others. And so in order to fulfill his great vow, he's willing to go into unfamiliar territory, learn new things, and that's also something I took heart, took to heart, and tried to um, try to learn to do that myself. So I will stop talking now. Um, I don't know if there's question. Uh, yes. Sheng Yan emphasized right view and said that it wasn't possible for anyone to awaken without right view. I wonder if that's something that you continue to uh, emphasize in your teaching, and if so, you might say a few words about it. Thank, thank you. Thank you for the question. The answer is yes. Um, I, I emphasize cultivating right view which along the way help us identify the erroneous view we hold. Um, uh, so we think, we understand what is impermanence, we understand what's emptiness, we understand these things, and then you may understand the general idea, but because we understand them through our pre-existing biases uh, from our conditioning, there are often traces, sometimes not small traces, giant boulders of uh, you know, erroneous views in it. And so it is through really working with, uh, with these teachings, then like when we ask our question, uh, that's where we review that we are coming from a certain, certain perspective that has a, some, some of that erroneous view. And that's why it is worthwhile for you to fully engage in this discussion, not to worry about uh, asking uh, what people will call stupid questions, uh, or uh, to not to worry about review, revealing that you have erroneous view. Actually, if you reveal it in your question, then you have an opportunity to say, oh, like I have that erroneous view. In fact, that's how, the, how, how, how I usually work with my my students, they ask a, they ask a question, and then I point out how actually there there's this this strand of view that is erroneous. It does not mean they're bad. They're very sincere practitioners, but we all need help in identifying our our erroneous view. That's the process of cultivating right view, and cultivating right view. Uh, is crucial, crucial to, to, the, to awakening. Otherwise, you think you're going towards awakening, but you might be going that way. <laughs> you, may be, you may be perpetuating, perpetuating erroneous view, perpetuating habits of vexation, perpetuating delusion without knowing. So, thank you for the question. Thank you so much for the talk. Um, I was wondering, I'm, I'm having a little bit, just a little bit of trouble fully grasping how a teacher could cause their student to feel such discomfort and frustration and anger um, as 
Master of Ching Yen uh, faced. And, and I was wondering how, how that could be purely out of compassion and what the true purpose of this is. Um, and if you think that it can be a dangerous thing for a teacher to impose such a thing on a student without it slowly turning into their own sort of ego-driven, sadistic Thank you. problem. Yeah. Thank you so much. That's a wonderful question. And um, very important is for the teacher to truly know what they're doing, to truly know themselves. So if they know that they have a tendency to want to control, to manipulate, then they should not be doing any such thing at all. Yeah. And so it has to do with integrity. And um, of course, Master Xun Yan's teacher did that because they had this relationship that had full trust. And so that comes to the issue of whether we trust, we are working with a teacher that we can fully trust. Do we know? Do we know our teacher? Do we, uh, do we, do we have confidence in our teacher's integrity? If you have doubt in your teacher's integrity, then you should not work with that teacher. If you don't think you can trust your teacher fully, you should not work with that teacher. Or maybe you not work with your teacher in, in that way. So maybe in like, you know, learn some more superficial thing, right? but like not at that level. So you, 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 are, you, are, you are actually um, in control. It's like, okay, my teacher is doing this, but I don't know about this teacher, then you don't have to let your teacher uh, do that. Does that make sense? Yes, but I'm still sort of struggling with how can someone cause someone to feel such, such frustration out of compassion in the first place? The great compassion comes from the fact that he was helping Master Xun Yan at that time to recognize his remaining self-centered con- uh, attachment. So maybe some sense of pride, some sense of like, I can do this, I can do it by myself. We all have traces of that. So he still needed help from his master to put him through a process to realize, oh, I still, I still have work to do. That's why it's great compassion. Yeah, it's a little counterintuitive because some we, 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 we tend to like to believe that um, especially in our education system, uh, teachers that make us feel that we are accomplishing things, making us feel confident that's a good teacher. We, we have this in our education here. Uh, in some way, that's, that's helpful. Uh, but when, when it comes to our very subtle, deep self-centered attachment, that's really obstacles for our awakening, for our liberation. It takes someone of great wisdom and compassion to, to help us see them in a skillful way. And the fact that Master Xin Yan recognized it as great compassion is that he could see it. Like someone from the outside says, oh man, he says his master's so mean. Or you might think he's a, such a mean person. But it's between them. They see that he saw that I'm benefiting greatly from this training. Yeah. Roshi? Uh, What you just said is related to something that I learned also training with uh, an Asian teacher, which is if your master uh, scolds you or is severe with you at times, that's good. That means you're worth it. If they ignore you, (laughs) that's bad. 
because you're not even worth it, the effort they have to put into correcting you and trying to bring you back. Mm -hmm. So it's the, all kind of the opposite of Western society. Mm -hmm. In Western society, if somebody criticizes things, you, you want to get away from them, right? It means they don't like you or whatever. And so you want a teacher who praises you, and that's a better path. <coughs> so it's, it's a very different view. Um, and of course, if we really look at our life, it's when we suffer that we learn the most. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if, if we're open to learning from it, not when we're having a good time. Yeah. But I wanted to ask you about, um, I was really struck when we began reading Master Shen Ying's books years and years ago, and I began you know, teaching from it, that he talked about this. So in, in Zen practice, it would be sudden versus uh, gradual awakening. And um, he, he talked about gradually refining the mind. So starting with, I don't, you would know the terms better than I can remember, but starting with the tangled, confused mind, and then um, simplified mind, then one-pointed mind, and then no mind as a, as a gradual um, path on, um, of practice. So I'm wondering if he, if, if he taught that when you were translating for him, mm -hmm. or um, how he did teach about um, sudden versus gradual. Yeah, I, I think that's from the, from the notion of like gradual cultivation and sudden enlightenment that uh, and so he was. Uh, he he realized people just need some kind of uh, description of you can say stages to break it down. Instead of saying just sudden enlightenment, it's okay from zero. Like so, that so he was trying to giving people some 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 steps so that they feel they have they have some direction along along some guideposts along the along the way. And he will often say that the sudden enlightenment refers to the realization, uh, what's called seeing the nature, Kenjo. It's the, su happens suddenly, it's, uh, and then it's what, what one, one realizes is no different from that which was seen and realized by the Buddha. It's just that usually for, for most people, Kenjo, seeing in nature, it was a very relatively brief experience, and then we return to our usual, deluded, habitual way of being. And so there's the gradual cultivation of preparing the mind, really stabilizing the mind, uh, the settling the mind, collecting, collect from scattered mind to collected mind, to one mind, really, you, really you, one mind meaning unification unification of body and mind, unification of body-mind with environment, unification um, thought after thought, really the much more subtle, subtle stabilization of mind or clarity, clarity that allows us to, um, to see what's already here, which is not, it's already here. So where, where? Our mind's so distracted, we're looking for something and forgetting right view forgetting that it's already here. So all that and causes and conditions come together. You realize, ah, and then, but still work to do because our habits, all the entrenched habitual tendencies, these vexations did not disappear with Kensho. The only difference is we know how to practice with them. We understand, we understand that they are not fixed entities, but we, it's a path that we continue to cultivate. So we, we will often clarify, it's very important not to equate Kensho or seeing the nature or enlightenment experience as a liberation. People still have lots of vexations. And that's why the question about some teacher they might have, they still have a lot of uh, their own issues. And so if they 
you know, impose certain thing on, on, on the student that's not appropriate because it might be actually perpetuating their, their habits. If they are not aware of that can be harmful and dangerous. So it's very important for students to keep an eye out for it because our, our uh, training with our teacher is co-created. We also have responsibility as students. It's not like, oh, that's a teacher. Like, you know, they're responsible for everything. I just do whatever they, they say. It's like, you need to discern. Also, it's our responsibility as well. Really, practice is to, it's about learning to take full responsibility, full responsibility for our life. Sometimes, we have a teacher and want to dump that responsibility on the teacher. So you're my teacher, so now you're responsible for my enlightenment. And your teacher is not responsible for your enlightenment. Your, your teacher give you guidance, point out your blind spot for you. It's your practice, your path. Take full responsibility. I think I saw your hand first and then and real quick I want to if anyone online has any questions you could raise your hand and we can take those now if not we'll go to people in the sender Thank you for your talk. Um, I really resonated with what you were speaking about with your your story and Master Sheng Yen's um, story regarding um, um, what you were sharing regarding um, what I know of in Zen and, and great determination, great vow, and um, perseverance and um, one of the undertones in that was the teaching of bodhicitta and not running away from that. And that becomes a driving force in our lives when we really listen to it long enough to the point that it becomes deafening. And I wanted to ask about Great Vow and also regarding what you were saying regarding taking full responsibility because no one's going to awaken us for us um, and for me. Um, to make it an I statement. Um, I would like to know what you can share regarding when it, we come to the edge, when I come to the edge of like, man, I don't, how, like, how do I deepen my vow further in practice, in my actions, regarding how much further can I really take my responsibility in my great, my great vow, whether it's to awaken and to how I show up in the world um, I mean, for those that are going to be, in, there are summer residents, like for me, going back into the world, like, man, I, how can I take this further on my own where I'm, where I'm not in a supportive container? Can I, do I, can I really trust myself with all my resistances to not only show up like I am here, but to show up even better and um, to bring that into my practice and... Um, I would like to know what you can share about that because I can feel I have a lot more, um, at least in myself, and I'm sure a lot of everybody, everybody else in the room can probably relate to that. So I'd love to know what you have to share about that. Thank you. Thank you for asking this question for everyone. It's a really good question. I don't know if we have enough time to talk about it because I, I was told <laughs> I'm supposed to be ending three minutes ago. Um, so I don't know, can you, are we okay? Like, okay. Um, Some of you had already expressed this anxiety, like this is uh, such a supportive container. It is very similar to the end of any retreats that I lead in the second to the last day. It's like, I'm afraid to leave the retreats. Mm -hmm. It's like, you, so the idea is like, I'm practicing well, and I want this to continue. I want meaning, 
what you're really saying is that I want to keep being able to be like this because I feel pretty good about myself. I'm calm. I am kind of responsible. <laughs> I'm not mean uh, or as mean as usual. Whatever habit you have, I like myself. Now I want to put it in a bottle and take it home and make it even better. Does it sound? That's your wish. You really like the self that has grown and developed here in this container, but you can't take the container with you. So what happened without this container? This is the time to cultivate right view and identify your erroneous view. What's the erroneous view? That the self that you are experiencing is permanent. As much as you like the version of you now, it is the coming together of causes and conditions. Exactly what you say, the container. You get woken up at 4.50 every morning, you meditate for an hour every morning, you meditate for two hours every evening. You have a lot of opportunity to settle your mind. You are with people who are also practicing, supporting you. You don't have a lot of time on your social media, on your TV. You don't have a lot of people saying things to you that are encouraging, perpetuating your unhelpful habits. Of course, you have the best version of yourself here, coming together of causes and conditions. And remember that you might like to think, this is the real me, and I want to take this with me. Ow. This is the you that, come, that emerges as these causes and conditions come together, which does not mean that there will be a worse version of you that we have no idea what will happen when you leave. Just knowing very clearly that, yeah, you, will your mind be more agitated? Of course, you're not meditating three hours a day. <laughs> you, will you be a little more easily distracted? Probably. Will you get um, upset with something more often than when you're here? Probably. Will you be uh, more likely to fall into your unhelpful habits? Possibly, because life outside is a little bit more um, stressful, yeah. have a lot more distraction, and um, and you see the 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 you that 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 emerges with that coming together of very different causes and conditions, and so when you notice that, it's like ah, self, there is really no fixed self. And then of course you're like, but I like the other self more. So can I go back to Great Vow to come to come look for your that good self? That's the opportunity to recognize your own view. There was the self that I want to go back to. Every time you recognize this erroneous view, you are cultivating right view. It's our default is erroneous view. Our default is to think that ourself, there is this place I can find this, make this perfect me. You can put, want to put it in a box. I just have to find it. We will keep going into that over and over again, forgetting right view. But every time you notice you do that, that is awareness that comes from your practice. So when you leave here and notice you're oh, so frustrated, why can't, be, why can't I be like that person when I was at Great Vow? Then that's the moment you recognize and your, your erroneous view and that's the moment to reconnect with right view. And that is how we practice. And so 
be careful. You mentioned I'm going to go out and do even better. It's like you practice. Every time we said, we said, I want, I want even more calm, more clear, more, more, more craving, craving, craving. What does craving bring? Suffering. Suffering. That's our default, our entrenched habit that we are on the path to unlearn. Every time you recognize it, you are unlearning it a little bit. So you're practicing well whenever you notice your suffering. You are doing good. Did I answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's time for maybe one more challenging question. Oh, yes. Mm. Um, so my question is about effort. And in your talk just now, you told many inspiring stories of people persevering and just putting in tremendous effort to extraordinary lengths. Um, and I'm noticing some sort of f drive that I have that is like, if I work hard enough, I'll be OK, and I'll be a good person. I'll, I'll, I can like rest on that, maybe, if I just like keep working hard versus some sort of feeling of like, I'm already good enough. And that like just this basic faith in, in goodness versus like this feeling of I really need to live life in the right way and apply the right effort and I have to hold the posture correctly and all these things to, to make sure that I am good. And so if you could talk about those, the tension between those two things, I would appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. This is a good question. And I'd like to invite you to listen to your question. So when you have these questions, listen to what you're saying. That will, we can learn to identify, ah, what are some of the places I'm getting hung up on? Like, so for example, you say, like I heard this, you know, perseverance and effort, and use the term, you use the adjective tremendous effort. Right? Um, so maybe notice how you're imagining that people just have to like work really hard, like all the time. You might be imagining like messaging and working like a maniac all the time, <laughs> so that he can He's such a great practitioner. So you are imagining, I have to work like a maniac all the time to be good practitioner. Um, I'm kind of just exaggerating this. Like, maybe not. Huh? Um, watch, watch out for the image you have created in your mind when you hear this word, like effort, vow, perseverance. Oh, that means this. And one of the most common um, misunderstanding and Master will talk about it. That has to do with the cultivation of uh, uh, diligence. Diligence, that's what you are speaking to. Um, most common way to understand it is that, yes, I have to practice really hard. So usually people get very inspired after being you know, at, in, resident, uh, in residential practice. <laughs> Seven days, one month, three months. And um, okay, I'm going to go home. And I sit two hours every day. <laughs> every day, two hours. And, and, and I do it, I should do it. And then, and then after like, I don't know, a week, you burn out. Or like, perhaps some people, they get very inspired. I go to Sashin, I go to a seven day retreat. I met people like this, seven day retreat after seven day, retreat after retreat after retreat. Cause they think that that will get, put them on a fast track to enlightenment or something, just work really hard. And then they burn out. That's not right effort. Not right effort. 
right effort. The way Master Shen Yan described it, it's like this small stream of water rather than a torrent. Like we usually think of effort as this torrent, lots of retreat. Meditate, 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 read, 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 and then just you know, practice like a maniac. No. no. Eat your meals, take your walks, do your work. When you're tired, you sleep. When you're hungry, you eat. And it's related to your question. How do you practice? You said, I want to um, deepen my practice. This. People always like, I want deep, how do I deep, deepen my practice? Not like, <laughs> how do we deepen our practice? Moment after moment after moment after moment. Every moment, wherever we are, whatever we do, maintain and cultivate this total clear awareness. That's it. So you will notice someone can use some help because you're paying attention this moment. Most of the time, we remember to pay attention once in a great while. Have you noticed that? So the way to, you call it, deepen your practice is to shorten those gaps And the difference between someone like Master Shen Yan and us is his gaps very small if they exist at all. We all can do that. It's not magic. Just practice. But it's not by practicing harder. And, and the point about the idea that um, if I practice hard enough, I can get to a place, then I'll be okay. Uh, it is uh, another erroneous view, believing that I can, I can achieve something, you know, practice whatever it is, like uh, calm or clarity or stability or uh, what you might call goodness, whatever it is, virtue, and then I can, oh, I can, I can, I can stop, I can retire from practicing. Uh, you know, we practice until all the way. That's why the Buddha way, eons, eons. We don't think about retiring from practice. Why? Every moment we practice, we don't suffer. Every moment we forget to practice, we suffer. That's it. So right now, you're perfectly fine. You don't need to be more whatever. And so part of the practice is to recognize that, oh, okay, I'm okay. Can I, can I learn something more? Like Master Shinru Suzuki would say, like, you are perfect as you are. But we are perfect as we are, but we all can use a little improvement. Right? I love that phrase. And where we, what we mean, what it means by we are perfect as we are. So all the causes and conditions come together. This is the only way we can be this moment. But does it mean that we cannot be different? Maybe you want to be a better writer. Yeah, you can be a better writer if you put your effort into practicing to be a better writer. So it doesn't mean that this is the only way you can be. You cannot be better at something. But in this moment, you are perfect as you are with all the causes and conditions that come before this moment and come together this moment. That's it. So yeah, you are perfect as you are right now. No problem. But we are good at turning ourselves into a problem. Have you noticed that? We're really good at that. So that's another habit we have. 
I don't know, did I answer your question? Did I address it? Yes. 